So, hello! Yeah. Welcome to... Be sure you're not an extrovert. <laughs> Welcome to Crooked Courage. And we have a wonderful treat for you today. Um, on our show today, we have Amar. 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 <laughs> and I worked for Mr. Yu. So, we have Amar. Yes, but by the way... Abdullah. I got boom, that part. Boom. Maybe boom. I should say Mr. Abdullah. Nah, no, I'm no, not no. a Mr. You're not a Mr. I'm just an Amar. Okay, and the um, only way anyone's ever remembered my name correctly, which no one does, mm -hmm. but the only way that I give them a moniker, like a rhyming thing, mm -hmm. like it rhymes with the only, uh, 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 the two worst words in English. Amr rhymes with Dahmer mm -hmm. and Bomber. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. They are the two worst words in English, I'm sure, as you can remember, our mm -hmm. friend Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm -hmm. And being Muslim and rhyming with Bomber, not a good move. Um, I think I have it. I hope I have it. So we're so glad to have Amr Abdullah yes. on our podcast today. He is the uh, manager or the owner of Cedars yep. Restaurant here in Hyde Park. And my first question for him is, what did he want to be when he was a kid? Oh, Because I imagine that he probably wasn't dreaming about owning a restaurant. No, no. So what was it? You wanted to be doctor. A doctor. You see, I'm I'm Middle Eastern, mm -hmm. and what you may or may not know, Charlene, or should I call you Pastor? Oh, go ahead with Charlene. Thank you. Uh, is most people from the Middle East, and even probably sometimes the Far East, uh, what they want their kids to really, really do? Africa is become, too. Is that right? Yeah. Become doctors. And so my parents, you know, put that in me, and I loved it. And I wanted to do it, and then I went to here to school at UFC. Mm -hmm. And one semester, and I'm like, actually, one trimester, and I was like, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was the first of my two hardest conversations I ever had with my parents was mm -hmm. to sit them down and tell them, Mom, Dad, I don't want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second hardest conversation was to sit them down ten years later after I was an investment banker at J.P. Morgan kind of a Wall Street guy. Mm -hmm. I sat him down and told him, Mom, Dad, I don't want to work on Wall Street anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, both those conversations were hard for them to hear. Mm -hmm. Maybe the second one harder because I told him instead of doing um, Wall Street, I wanted to do comedy and be a comedian. Mm -hmm. And they didn't find that funny at all. No, no. Well, but interesting, when I fe first met Amr, I got it right, right? I'm conscious now. When I first met Amr, I thought he was like funny. I mean, that's what kind of, you know, we were at the Hyde Park Chamber of Commerce and I was like, this guy is funny. He's okay. hilarious. So even if you were not funny to your parents, uh, <laughs> and many of us are not funny to our parents. That's but. true. Well, I think they find me funny in general. Really? But the idea of me leaving a field that makes a lot of money and is very mm -hmm. secure for something very uncertain like comedy mm -hmm. was just, you know, they wanted nothing to do with it. But hey, I'm, my, I'm my own man, so I got to make my own decisions, you know? Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about this, you know, comedian thing. I mean, how's, yeah. that, how's that working for you? Uh, hard. Very hard. It's a, it, it, I think I chose to do it, Charlene, because... I grew up in small business. My father owned Harper Foods on 57th and Harper for a long time, mm -hmm. for years, probably 15 years, then opened up Cedars. Um, so I grew up in retail. I grew up in business. I'm really comfortable with business. I, it just comes to me, you know? Mm -hmm. But trying to apply all those, and so that's why I was also successful on Wall Street. I just used whatever I learned in business as a kid, mm -hmm. since I was six, seven years old. Um, all that has been used on Wall Street and it made me very successful. But I was like, I need to do something and grow in a way that I've never grown before. Something that I'm pretty weak in. Which was the idea of show business. Mm -hmm. And so it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Because I'm just, especially approaching comedy as a business. I, I like the show of show business. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at the business part of show business, and I've had to admit that. And so, um, while it's been fun to tell jokes and write jokes and hang out with people mm -hmm. in that way at comedy clubs, it's been really hard from a, I want this to work and pay my bills. Just almost, almost, for me, it's been almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So, it's a slow grind, but I'm working at it. Okay. 
So when is your next gig? Or is I, there a gig? I have a one hour, yes, I do have something coming up. There hasn't been much in the world of comedy this year. Mm -hmm. As you might have seen, Dave Chappelle had his show eight, I forgot what it was, 846, I believe, the amount of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, on, George, yeah. Jo uh, George that was Ford. creative, wasn't it? On Netflix, I, I think I saw that where they social distance and everything. Yeah, exactly. Did he put? He might have put it on Netflix. Okay. I thought I only saw it on YouTube, but maybe it was on Netflix. Maybe it was YouTube. You know. Yeah. So that might be the only. Everything else has been virtual, very mm -hmm. little in-person stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a storytelling show coming up on September 26th at a place called Green Shirt Studio. It's an acting studio up north in Ravenswood. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be doing a one hour, uh, one man show about me, my story, my life, humorous, some of the crazy things. Mm -hmm. um, I talk a little bit about the three times I got arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about um, growing up with my dad and the wacky things he would do to make a dollar out of 15 cent. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, a one man show that mixes some comedy and stand up into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, please pass on the information. I, I would love to. Thank you. You heard it here. September 26th, Green Shirt Studio. In person, socially distanced, but it will also be virtual for those who obviously are not comfortable going out. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. So, I'm curious, how do you, um, where do you get your material from? I'm not like, I don't laugh at everything, but there are some things that kind of get me, and so it's interesting to see how people uh, put their content together and how, you know, I don't get it easily, but when I get it, you know, I really get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm just curious, and as I listen to comedians, it's just interesting how it flows and how their content comes together. So you're a really difficult audience member. Really? I'm, because, I'm <laughs> because because we want, nothing makes a comedian happier than for someone to smile and laugh. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's kind of why I think I like the restaurant business. It's so easy for someone to come in and order some food and they smile and say, I can't wait to home, get home and eat this, you know, sandwich or meal mm -hmm. or whatever. And so there's an exchange and a big smile, you put a smile on it, you say a few things and I love that. Mm -hmm. um, that's the extrovert in me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's the audience members who, who, you know, like you said, like, comedy and jokes and joke writing it's not like it just comes right to them or they get every joke mm -hmm. you know uh, like for example that comment I made about my name only rhymes with the two worst words mm -hmm. in English downer and bomber that's a joke I've written mm -hmm. and I was waiting for you to laugh <laughs> You just looked at me like, <laughs> and I was just like, damn. Yeah, I didn't even get like the, you know, until you said. But like here's, what, really here's, here's what you did get. You just laughed at yourself. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. And so once I realized, oh, this isn't the easiest audience member in the world, I got I to gotta tweak my material a little bit and make fun of me and make fun of her in order to get a joke going. And there you go. You're laughing and smiling. It's yeah, like So, wow. Well, I mean, that's a gift to, to bring to the restaurant industry. Right. Kind of. I'm, try I'm trying to train my staff to be able to do that. It can't just be me at the register doing it all day long. <laughs> um, or me when I do samples outside, just doing... I sit outside sometimes do samples, I'm doing crowd work. I'm talking mm -hmm. about people's clothes, people's hair. You know, I'll see a dude and this girl walking down the street and I'll be mm -hmm. like, would you like to try a sample? And, oh yeah, sure. And I'll be like, man. So I look at the guy and I'm like, I look at the woman and I'm like, so this is what you settled for? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Again, the joke that I expected you to laugh, but there's no, no chance in hell. Well, I'm wondering what did the person say? Like, he, la he laughed. He did. Yeah. Okay, because I'm know. like, that can either work or that can oh, not work. Oh, you hurt him. Yeah, right. yeah. It, it's about intention and energy. And is it said with a per from a place of love? Uh -huh. I was kind of chatting him up already a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was like, and like mm, this tastes good. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was kind of telling me, like, uh, he was kind of like, the vibe we had going was he felt like he was a lucky guy for being with this woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is what you, you know, so, he, so anyway. Let's, the more we explain jokes, the worse they get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just either got to get it or you, <laughs> you have to explain it. <laughs> so do you have a comedian um, that is a, like someone you look up to? It used to be Louis C.K. Okay. 
And after the incident he had with uh, younger women in the world of comedy, it just felt uh, like I didn't. I didn't think what he did was the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Have you kept up with much of all his drama? No. Okay. <laughs> I, with a wonderful pastor like yourself, I'm gonna um, protect your ears and your heart from mm -hmm. telling you what this man did. It was obviously related to um, his behavior towards women. Mm -hmm. So that took a little bit of shine off the apple for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now it's probably Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like Dave is fantastic. There's also another guy named Andrew Schultz that not many people have heard of yet. He's kind of up and coming. Mm -hmm. um, he's really good too. I like him a lot. Yeah. So there's a couple guys I like a lot. Yeah. Uh, if I had to pick one more, it would be Stephen Colbert. Okay. From the uh, Late Show. Mm -hmm. Way before Late Show, he was a Second City guy, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. student and teacher. Okay. So yeah, I look up to him as well. Yeah, I like you know I don't know if you remember Dick Gregory. Um, of course. I really liked him, and I like Trevor Noah. And something that's like odd, my friends can't stand this person. They're like, he's a male chauvinist and, you know, hasn't done his political work as Steve Harvey, but oh. I don't know. So at night, you know, it works for me. So again, you have to find that person that kind of, you know, like yeah. connects with you. That's and, right. That's yeah. a, great, a great way to look at it. It's yeah. a great way to look at it. I yeah. agree. So, um... You know, you are the owner of Cedar Restaurant. Yes. That's correct. Yes, Cedars, and, absolutely. And you have siblings. Like, how did they come to you? How did you end up being the owner? My brother owns restaurants himself downtown. Mm -hmm. um, he has a, a chain of, like, seven restaurants. So he's in the restaurant business. He helps me quite a bit. Uh, my sister, my oldest sister is a nurse. My second sister is a pharmacist. My mm -hmm. third sister uh, works in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. So... It just like I was like the guy trying to do comedy, and the closest thing to comedy, the closest thing to food business or restaurant business was comedy. It's like they're both kind of like mm -hmm. you're in the entertainment business a little bit. You got to entertain guests at the restaurant. You got to entertain people in an audience. You know, you're you're in general trying to put smiles on people's faces. Mm -hmm. So, and truth be told, I came in to uh, kind of like wind the restaurant down. Mm -hmm. God rest his soul, after my father passed away, mm -hmm. we're like, well, what are we going to do with the restaurant? Like, that was his baby. And I went in to kind of figure it out, look at it, assess the situation, and possibly likely close it. It wasn't making money. It was kind of a break-even business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, there's something really cool about this, and this could be fun. And I started seeing a vision. Um, and so that's that's how it came to be. And I was like, let's keep it open. I'm going to give it the old college try. And it's been it's been great. Uh, I'm trying to get it to make money amidst the pandemic. That kind of was a big shock mm -hmm. to the restaurant industry and to our restaurant as well. Uh, but I gotta tell you, things are moving in the right direction. They feel good. Uh, we're working hard. We're hustling. Um, we've changed up the menu. We brought on a new wonderful chef named Chef Amado Lopez. Mm -hmm. This man is a wonderful man. He's very humble, but mm -hmm. he's a Charlie Trotter protege, and he worked for Rick Bayless uh, as chef de cuisine for six years as well. And he's changed up our menu in fun and cool ways. We're kind of doing a theme of Mideast meets Midwest. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of the things we have on our menu now kind of reflect that. This is an example. Right here, my friends, we have something called Arab Swag Nachos, mm -hmm. which you got to try on camera uh -huh. and tell us the truth uh -huh. as to whether you like it or you don't like it. Now, the only issue is I may never get this container open. Right, right. There we go. This is homemade pita chips, mm -hmm. whipped garlic sauce made fresh, a lamb kebab grilled and chopped up on there, diced tomatoes, sliced sweet pickles, and a nutty chili salsa with some lemon wedges. Okay. You want to go for it? I do. I do. Wait, John, do you want to try one? <laughs> <laughs> Come on! He thinks it's probably social distancing violation. Mm -hmm. Come on, Wajin. We probably are. Come on, the camera. Oh, no, no, no. Huh? That's okay. <laughs> Everyone, our awesome producer, Wajin, works the hardest out of all of us to make this podcast happen. Here mm. we go. Here we go. I'll help you out. Take one there. There you go. Okay, Wajin, just, so, just so you all know, Wajin is very upset with me. He's mad at me. He's been yelling at me for the last no, half No, his husband is upset with me. Oh, I'm sorry. His husband's upset with me. Thank you. <laughs> because we've, we've changed the menu at Cedars. 
we had an older menu that my father, God rest his soul, had, and we've had to switch chefs and everything because, well, we just can't make it as good as my dad. And um, we're trying to win back some of those customers who, who felt like, oh no, where's my, you know, older dish? Mm -hmm. um, we have some really good stuff. That this I believe is not in. bad, you all. You like that? No, I do. Wei Jun. Nice. We're getting thumbs up just so you guys know. <laughs> now, I'm going to get a little bit. I'm trying to get the meat on here and not touch the food. My favorite part is the homemade pita chips. Other people say they like the lamb kebab on there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm. I was gonna come and buy some today, but I don't have to. There you go. Now. But I will come. Now you're just gonna crave it tomorrow and you'll come tomorrow or the next day. Maybe. So what do we have for all the viewers watching? See, <laughs> what do we have for them? Yes. Hmm. Like if someone watches Crooked Courage and they mm, see this, mention it. how should we, you know, entice them to come like your way? I like that. I've been trying to get him to have a rewards program, but he's resisting. This is true. <laughs> you know my rewards program? Yeah. No, you're right. That's something we, we have in, in on the docket to do soon. Mm -hmm. um, I think, we have, so we have a cool new drink mm -hmm. called Watermelon Sugar. I saw that. I follow you on Instagram. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is a fresh squeezed watermelon and fresh squeezed lemonade mixed together but somehow separated in the cup so that the lemonade is on the bottom half and the watermelon is on the top half. Mm, mm. A little artistic drinks, drink pouring skill that we have. Um, anyone who listens to this podcast and says, um, I saw you all, or I saw Amr on Crooked Courage. And you pronounce his name correctly. Boom. Boom shakalaka. Go. Go ahead. <laughs> I like your extrovert coming out. They'll have a, they can get a free watermelon watermelon sugar. Mm -hmm. A free watermelon drink. Yes, free watermelon sugar drink. And don't just come in for the drink. Order some food. There you go. So I have to tell you, I was sick about a year ago, mm. and um, just couldn't digest hardly anything. And my friend was like, "You need to go over to Cedars and get you some good wholesome food." So I started eating the lime chicken, not the lime chicken, the lemon chicken soup. Yes. And that was like, that's my dish. That's good. The problem is, like, I call up, <laughs> and it's not every day, right? Because you Correct. guys switch. So it's like I have to get my um, rhythm in sync with the days that you guys You know what? It. And i got to be honest with you, during the pandemic, we haven't made it. You mm -hmm. know, we, we mm -hmm. stuck with the two lentils. Mm -hmm. um, so... I hope to bring that back, although I must be honest with you, we've been keeping the menu so slim mm -hmm. to just keep less cooks in the kitchen, less mm -hmm. dis you know, keep the distancing easier. With a big menu, which is uh, one thing, we, you know, Wei husband maybe, maybe would be helpful if I spoke to him one day. With a big menu of 50, 75, 100, my dad had 100 items on there. You need like, yeah, you need so many employees to manage that, make it, but more importantly, Check it frequently to make sure it's it, it's mean, fresh and it's good. You, you just got to be all over the. You got to be aware of the dates and this and the that. And so it's just it's a lot of uh, work uh, and a lot of people you need. And so it just makes it less efficient to run that business, you know. And so we we moved away from the items that were were not selling. We obviously took off mm -hmm. the items that were good, not great. We took off, and we said, you know what? Let's just let's just sell the favorites. You know, the top ten. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things I'm learning because I read a memoir um, from a chef is that oftentimes the chef um, may be cooking a dish that's not their native dish. Mm. So like when I go to Benihana, it's not a lot of <laughs> Japanese actually in the. That's right. And when you just mentioned your chef, so how does that work? You're cooking Mediterranean dishes, dishes that may not be your native space. Right. Or, right. Do you guys do some kind of orientation or it's just when you hire the chef, they have background or a chef can cook any kind of 
Yeah. How does that work? They can cook any kind of cuisine? So for, for, for the longest time, it was my father, and he would hire a chef here and there, but they were all from the Middle East. So it was all just their knowledge, mm -hmm. their experience. You know, they, they knew the cuisine really well because they're from the Middle East. But ever since he passed, um, I brought on, I, I hired who I thought was the best human being. Really? I did not necessarily look for the best Middle Eastern chef. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. Um, the reason was that I, I want to just work with good people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I said, let's let, so Chef Amaro was that person. He's just a, just a good, solid, humble, hardworking, fun human being. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, let's let this brother's experience dictate the menu. Mm -hmm. And people may not love that but at least they're gonna get some of the best food in Chicago. I mean, he worked with Charlie Trotter, he worked with Rick Bayless. He, he, he's been around wonderfully talented chefs. Mm -hmm. And so we took advantage of that, you know? Um, you know, he, he brought that experience to the menu so that now on our falafel sandwich, for example, we don't have a tahini Jerusalem salad, we have a spicy tahini on there. Mm -hmm. We have, and I think that's probably inspired by Rick Bayless, because there's a lot of spicy food in Mexican cuisine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, uh, on that, let's see, a whipped garlic sauce that we make with just egg whites to keep it on the healthier side. So he let Mediterranean inspire him, or Middle Eastern food inspire him, and he made things that he knew he'd be very comfortable with. We just want to take advantage of his experience and marry that with Middle Eastern food. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we get Mid-East meets Midwest, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me is some of the parallel truths you're finding in your restaurant. Um, also, you can find in churches and religious spaces that some of your older congregants really like tradition. They like what they like and they know what they like. Yeah. And that ability to change Woo. is hard. And is you, hard. So you find it also in the restaurant industry as well. That's where, so Wade Jen's husband's a great example, right? Like, you, you become used to something, you almost like fall in love with something. Mm -hmm. You know, you really, and it, it, and it, it creates a memory for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I came here and had the XYZ dish at Cedars mm -hmm. in 2012. And oh, now my late father is no longer with us, but I wanna go back and have that dish to relive that memory. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's hard to contend with. And what I've been doing is sitting them down and just telling them my story. Mm -hmm. And tell them I don't expect you to necessarily love this place and stay here and revisit us. You might this might be your last time. You may even just walk out right now. Mm -hmm. But here I am. Like one person, I put I play hip hop in the music in the in the I play hip hop music in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And one person said, you know, turn that racket off. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and he's like, put some real music on. And I I just crouched down. I looked at my eye to eye. I was like, sir, I totally respect and honor and understand. Mm -hmm. your preference for Middle Eastern music mm -hmm. and an authentic, ethnic Middle Eastern menu. And I just wanted to share with you, like, you know, I had to go through my own journey to arrive at mm -hmm. a place where I feel like I'm in integrity with myself, mm -hmm. owning this restaurant. If I kept the Middle Eastern music and I kept the authentic Middle Eastern menu that my dad had, and I kept the same setup of his dining room and, and the feel and the look and the feel and the uniforms. I kept it all like my dad. It's not my restaurant. It's just my dad's restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's not Amr's, you know? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm kind of a phony. I'm a fake. I'm running a restaurant. I'm running my dad's version of the restaurant who's not even with us anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just didn't want to run that business. I was like, I'll run something that resonates with me and whoever, whoever that vibes with. Mm -hmm. Come on in. And so that's kind of been my, my, my uh, MO, is let me do what resonates with me, that inspires me, and whoever that speaks to, welcome. And if it doesn't speak to you, you know, I'm sad to hear that. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware that not all of us are gonna love hip hop and, mm -hmm. you know, Arab swag nachos. They're just right. not everyone's gonna right. like it. Right. Right. That wonderful man heard my story. He, he's like, well, it's very diplomatic of you. I appreciate it. Fine, let me try these nachos. And he loved it. He loved it. He's a man in his 60s, lived in High Park for a long, long time. He loved it. And, uh, and I, I just simply lowered the music for him. And he was cool with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try, I try and explain to those guests, like, he, here's the situation. Let me tell you a little story. Mm -hmm. And if it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, 
you know, with mm -hmm. all due respect and honor, uh, I appreciate all the support you've given us in the past. Yeah, yeah. I think also it doesn't hurt that you're charismatic and you seem to be very humble and genuine, mm. you know. Thank so you. maybe that comes across in your demeanor. I hope that's true. Thank you very much. The way you relate to people. I will say this. If you spot it, you got it. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing that in me, you must have that in you, Pastor. Oh, well, that's sweet. Sweet. I was like, you could be a pastor, but I know that's not your calling, right? <laughs> it was this close. Really? Oh, yeah. I think comedians are pretty much this close to being pastors or, or, or religious leaders. They're doing it right. They're speaking to an audience. Right. Know. It is. It is you that know? connection kind of. Thing. And they're trying to speak truth. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very, very. In fact, Chris Rock says some of the stuff he listens to, he doesn't listen. He doesn't always listen to just comedy. Chris Rock was like, he listens to a lot of spoken word. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, you know, I think religious leaders speaking for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I love that. And, and my, one of my close people in my life is my spiritual guide. Mm -hmm. I'm Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I go, I like to visit him too. He's, he's a, a wonderful man and has inspired me. So mm -hmm. much of what you probably experience from me, you're just experiencing that man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how long has your family had business? Is, has it been all of your childhood that your dad had business in Hyde Park? Or? Yeah, yeah. He bought Harper Foods in 1980, the year I was born. Mm -hmm. So for 40 years, my family's been in Hyde Park mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in one form or another. Originally Hi Harper Foods, then uh, Cedars on 53rd and Cornell. Mm -hmm. Have you been in Hyde Park a long time? I was here for a period of time when I came to school in the 90s, and then I left, and then I came back in okay. um, 2017, maybe. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, but I mean, I've come through, and I knew Cedars was not, you know, that it had moved. Right, right, so 53rd Cornell, and then now mm -hmm. Kimberly Plaza. Uh, so yeah, long time, long time. It's been a minute. Well, I have a couple more questions. You are really engaging, you're funny. Um, this may, this is an awkward question a little bit for me. Oh, you those guys, are my favorite. Right. You guys say that you're a Mediterranean restaurant, and that covers a region. Yes. That's not, you know, like if I said, oh, we're going to a Nigerian restaurant, I'd be Nigerian if I said I was going to an Italian restaurant. But when you say Mediterranean, say a little bit more like, you know, how many countries does that cover, and why is it yeah. called Mediterranean versus, versus Lebanon? Or Correct. It was originally Cedars, <laughs> it was originally Cedars Lebanon. Right, right. Yeah. That was the original name. And that lasted for 10 years. Nah, eight years. Eight years, eight or nine mm -hmm. years at 53rd and Cornell. And it was pr predominantly Lebanese food because my dad spent a lot of time in Lebanon. We're Palestinian, mm -hmm. but he spent a lot of time in Lebanon, so he knew that cuisine pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's what it was originally. Then we moved here to Kimbark Plaza. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it became clear my dad wanted to add a bunch of things on the menu that were North African. That were, you know, um, he started doing a lot of uh, uh, food manufacturing and food production for the co-op. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember the co-op, mm -hmm. the grocery store. So he would do some Italian things. I remember, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so he wanted Where to- Where you could buy those containers that exactly. were free, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, so he, uh, he started saying, well, you know what, let's explore the whole Mediterranean region from, um, yeah. from you know, Italy to North Africa, especially like the couscous and those things, mm -hmm. including um, the Middle East. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, we've ventured into other parts of the Mediterranean and brought those into our cuisine. What do you do for fun in your downtime? Because it's obvious you have a lot of on time and... I hear being a manager of a restaurant is very tiring and yeah. takes up a lot of time. So, you know, everybody knows you kind of in the Hyde Park area for this, but, yeah. you know. My, it used to be hanging out with my friends, especially my guy friends. Mm -hmm. They would just, we'd just be a bunch of clowns, you know. Mm -hmm. But life has changed the last six years, Charlene. I new normal, yeah. Right. I mean, I've gotten married. And in the last in the last six years, so six years ago I got married. Okay. And then four years ago we had our daughter Maryam. Mm -hmm. And two years ago we had our son Muhammad Ali. Oh, yes. yeah. So your daughter's name is Maryam. Is it a little takeoff of yours or no? No, it's it's Mary. Okay. But the Arabic word for Mary, Maryam. Okay. Yeah, like you know, the Spanish language says Maria for Mary. Arabs say Maryam for mm -hmm. Mary. Um, so that's her name, and then my son is Muhammad Ali, who's a huge inspiration to me. 
Really? Um, yeah. really? Say, uh, it seems like a little bit of black culture has kind of connected with you. I mean, because you say hip hop. Absolutely, so, so, yeah, yeah. I think the African Americans are an oppressed community. There's, sure. there's, there's zero ambiguity about that mm -hmm. uh, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm Palestinian. Right. And we as Palestinians are an oppressed people. Um, I believe that uh, it's it's been a very difficult, ugly at times, many times situation in the Middle East, um, and so I, I experienced that. My father, at gunpoint, was you know three years old, told to leave his home with his family. Mm -hmm. So it was a difficult, difficult. Um, it is a difficult reality to get grips of. Mm -hmm. um, so, of all people in the United States, wherever I felt most connected to and welcome with is is hip hop and uh, the black community. So that. That resonates for me um, in many ways. That helps me feel some sort of sense of mm -hmm. peace, community. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so Muhammad Ali is a classic, classic example of that. Right? So your son's walking around and... Uh, <laughs> poor guy's got a big name to live up to. Muhammad Ali Abdullah? Yeah. Okay. He ain't getting through any airport security easy. <laughs> no, no, that one right there. <laughs> hey, you got that joke. There you go. And so um, was it kind of a collaboration, you know, how did you and your wife, or is it the primary role of the father to in name? your culture to name? My wife and I, yeah, we collaborated on it. And we spoke to our spiritual guide. I mean, the name we love is Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And we gave him the middle name of Ali mm -hmm. because it just made so much sense from the inspiration perspective. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's how we came. So his name is Muhammad and his middle name is Ali. We often call him Muhammad Ali. Um, and yeah, so me and Linda liked it and we ran it by my spiritual guy. Like, what do you think? It's like, oh, a beautiful name. So it was natural. So and so now we have a, a third a daughter. We're expecting a daughter on November 25th. OMG. Yeah, right. Wow. Boom. OMG. Rock it up. Right? So uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. They, they, they keep me young and they keep me having fun. Yeah, you know, I was talking to one lady and she was saying, you know, because for ladies, often they lose a lot when they give birth to a child. And she was saying, I'm not going to change who I am. I'm not, you know, she just mm. felt real steadfast and she was a, a career woman. Mm. And she said, and then I gave birth to twins and it totally changed who I was. Isn't that something? <laughs> My wife too. My wife too. Uh -huh. My wife is a wonderful, I believe, world-class artist. And mm. she's paused a lot of her work for that mm. reason because mm. she wants to raise wonderful human beings and she loves them so dearly. So it's such a huge uh, responsibility when a woman gives birth mm -hmm. and the urge that woman feels mm -hmm. to protect those children. I call it, they go into like mama bear, they become mama bear, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how did it change you? Or did it? Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. um, how did it change me? I, my daughter especially had a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, making me a more gentle man, mm -hmm. you know, um, just a little, little girl, you know, it's just, it just melts my heart, you know, uh, more easily brought to tears, just soften me up a little bit, soften mm -hmm. me up a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, men, we like to be warriors, you know what I mean? We can still do that and have that softer side. So I would say that's yeah. how it, how it yeah. impacted me. And sometimes there's that deeper connection between girls and fathers and sometimes a deeper connection between sons and moms, and moms yeah. you know so maybe a little of that was going on but i know you are on a time and we're having such a good time with the yeah. for our long time. hours right right but we can't do hours we both have to get back to our job so the question i ask final the last yes. question i usually ask for people is what's on your bucket list before you leave this earth what is mm. one thing you'd like to do or what's on that bucket list of just something you'd like to do before before you've lived it Oh. Yeah, I, I gotta say, uh, I don't have I don't have that. I don't, it, my I cousin feel, said that. I was like, no, just go along with the with the question, question right? right? Right, but I feel know. like I had it and I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And when I started traveling to places like Africa and meeting mm -hmm. my spiritual guide, and mm -hmm. um, and then I jumped from Wall Street to comedy, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, I've been checking them off my bucket list. And mm -hmm. so I feel like I. I feel like it, it, something on my bucket list doesn't last too long. Mm -hmm. I kind of get, I gotta get it done. Mm -hmm. It helps you stay in the moment. Mm -hmm. So once it's on my bucket list, I'm like, let's go, let's go. Let me get on an airplane. I gotta go to Africa. Let me, let me change my career. Let me figure out how I do this. Okay. So I feel like that's how I think about life. Is, um, you know, what's the next thing I really gotta do? Let me get cracking. So mm -hmm. um, right now it's to make cedars 
uh, the number one restaurant in High Park. That's mm -hmm. on my bucket list. Okay. I don't know how fun that is, but the idea of serving hundreds of people a day is so exciting and doing it with something super unique. So that there you go. That is that that that's right. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very Omar, much. Thank you. Your time. Screwed it up again, Charlene. You screwed it up again. I did? Yeah. Not Omar? It's not Omar. It rhymes with Dahmer and Bomber. The two Omer. worst words in Omer. Boom. Omer. Amr, thank you so much. Amr Abdullah. Boom. <laughs> thank you, Wajja. And thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. And please get over to Cedars, because this...